Corinne Rowland. My name is Corinne Rowland, and I'm joining from Sacramento State. Um, I'm a Universal Design for Learning lead in the Academic Technology Center. And I'm here with my colleagues, uh, Dennis and Katie, if they'd like to introduce themselves. Sure, this is uh, Dennis Dahlquist. Um, I'm a faculty in uh, electrical engineering, computer engineering, um, and uh, incorporated uh, uh, universal design and uh, also a faculty mentor for, uh, for Sac State and uh, uh, for many other chancellor's office uh, operations too. Katie, thank you. Hi, I'm Katie Beekman. I'm part of our Academic Technology Center at Sacramento State, and I review all our campus's technology requests for accessibility concerns and uh, work with vendors on trying to make their products more accessible and um, coming up with workarounds when needed with uh, departments requesting not fully accessible technology items. Thank you, Dennis and Katie. So our presentation today is titled Potential Conflicts Between Following UDL Principles, which are providing choice or multiple pathways and accessibility. So we're really looking to discuss today um, what the UDL principles are and what accessibility principles are. Um, and the fact that um, there are many similarities um, and goals that are similar um, between the two concepts, um, but there's also a potential for a conflict. So we want to make sure we address those and also provide a couple of scenarios and um, workflows to consider. Okay, what is accessible design? This means ensuring learners can access all course content and activities and easily interact and navigate with course components. This includes learners who use adaptive or assistive technologies. And UDL design in short is, uh, it provides a blueprint for creating instructional goals, methods, materials, and assessments that work for everyone. And it's not a single one size fits all solution, but rather flexible approaches that can be customized and adjusted for individual needs. So as I mentioned, there are potential um, for conflicts that we will take a look at here. When you're designing course content, you wanna make sure you're considering not only UDL principles, but accessibility um, and having that in mind from the get-go will, will really make your, um, your design more seamless and um, it'll make it so that it's um, less time intensive in the long run. So two examples we're gonna discuss today and there, there's plenty more. Um, as soon as I'm done with my part, I'll, I'll put in a, um, a Google Doc that we can share um, to address some interactions um, and also some conflicts um, or intersections and conflicts with the UDL and accessibility. So um, the two topics we'll discuss today though um, are using infographics, images, and instructional video as well as third-party tools. So considering UDL and accessibility while providing infographics, images, and instructional video are that um, making sure that you're offering equivalent methods that are accessible to those types of materials. So for example, you would want to use alternative texts for images, captions and transcripts, um, and even audio descriptions for instructional video. And um, another equivalent text um, might be um, a longer description for infographics. So the, the main point um, we like to address is that instructors aren't necessarily asked to get rid of a certain format, but ensuring that you're checking for accessibility and providing those multiple ways of accessing the types of materials is fundamental for UDL design. So next, uh, third-party tools. Um, this is the type of third-party tools um, that are meant to be interactive by your student. And these type of tools that your student will need to engage with and interact with need to be checked for accessibility. 
So although it is engaging to, um, you know, test out new types of um, products or tools that might be um, really engaging, you want to make sure that all your students are able to access that tool. Um, and Katie will talk more about that um, in the next few minutes. So um, another thing to consider is always making sure you're placing an accessibility statement in the course learning management system or your syllabus. Um, just making sure you're addressing that um, you're open to um, hearing if there's any problem or barriers accessing any of the materials and making sure that um, your students know that you are considering accessibility as um, the forefront of all your course design. You like me now. Okay. All right, Dennis. <laughs> uh, this is Dennis Dahlquist. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, like coming from a little bit of a uh, faculty sort of perspective on some of these things, uh, I had um, got very excited uh, about uh, making some uh, changes to my course. And so I uh, went in and made some videos. Um, and uh, then um, because I, uh, some of the students were saying, well, um, gee, there's so much uh, text here. Could I have like a, a, you know, a video, something to work with? So I went to uh, put all these videos together and then uh, I got student comments coming back with, um, uh, could you just have it written up so I could just kind of go through it kind of quickly instead of forcing me to go through the video? So that uh, gave me a real clue to uh, what you really need to do is more universal design and provide both and really provide a, an, an area there. So um, I also found that um, uh, it's not necessarily just um, uh, students who are disabled that need uh, particular access and the particular thing, but also that it's more, uh, again, more of a universal design. A number of um, students basically uh, will use the material also, as we uh, saw a little bit earlier with uh, using Ally to basically take some of the documents, turn them into um, uh, audio sources and stuff like that that can make that uh, very useful and helpful for them. Uh, so uh, some of the tools that um, I use are, are Zoom like we do, uh, and um, the nice thing is that it does uh, uh, have the captioning uh, particular piece there. Um, another tool used uh, basically is um, Panopto. Uh, one of the nice things about Panopto is then whatever else is also shared on the screen or shown on the screen, it'll also, uh, also OCR that, and so that um, it will be included in, in part of the uh, transcript so that what the students can do uh, then is actually search for particular key items in the, in the uh, uh, topics uh, that have been presented. Um, I demonstrate this to the students so they basically they can kind of see how uh, they can actually help their studying and basically finding key information that they're looking for. Um, uh, the other thing they sort of ref referred to just a little bit earlier too was a situation where uh, I was uh, 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 in part of an FLC and uh, there was some research articles that were being presented uh, up and I tried to use the uh, uh, convert it to uh, an audio because I'd like to sort of um, have it read to me a little bit because I'm also a little dys dyslexic and stuff like that. Uh, the problem was that the document wasn't really accessible and what was happening was it was reading you know, uh, across the page, even though there were a series of columns. So it was reading uh, the first sentence from one column and then the next column and then the next column instead of going down the column. And so it was very confusing. So it really does need to be sort of an accessible type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that um, it's useful even if I have like an infographics type of piece uh, up there that I also provide some text-based uh, type of uh, um, the, same, uh, the same information, but just in a... Um, uh, a different sort of format for that. The other thing was on uh, third-party tools. Um, I think it's uh, one wants to be really careful about um, whether they're how accessible they are, and also dealing with uh, things like FERPA and some of the other types of um, issues. One of the things I found to sort of deal with that in the classroom was to use some, maybe some of those engagement tools, making sure that they're sort of accessible in that regard. But as far as the um, 
for things like Kahoot, for example, it would be an example. Uh, it gives a gamification that, that comes into play. But I find that if instead of having the quizzes in there or trying to uh, track their particular performance in there, have it more interactive on that particular piece, but then having uh, the actual quizzes or whatever other particular types of assessment tools actually in the LMS in that regard. Thank you. I'll hand it back to you, Corinne. Go ahead. Thank you, Dennis. There you go, Katie. Okay, so this slide outlines this slide <clears throat> outlines some basic guidelines for selecting accessible materials. For the first guideline, design content, you'd ideally want to make content you're going to use accessible and usable to all potential users from the outset of the design phase. Um, by creating accessible materials from the start, that can save you from having to go back and retrofit all your materials to meet and individual students specific needs. Um, and you also want to be mindful about whether the tools that are being used will enhance or reinforce the content and not detract from the main purpose of the activity or assignment. Um, the next guideline for supporting UDL, consider providing multiple means of representation. And this is a principle that a lot of faculty probably already do and maybe you know don't even really think about it. And that's presenting or covering information in more than one format. For example, if students have an assigned reading, assigned reading <clears throat> and then the main points and key terms are also discussed verbally and diagrams or images are also displayed, that would support this guideline. Uh, the last guideline, check for accessibility on at least one version. So providing multiple formats of materials can help ensure that students will be able to access at least one of the versions of the material. Um, it's often not practical or possible for all materials to be completely accessible to everyone. So having at least one version that's accessible to everyone is sufficient. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, some general steps for acquiring accessible technology tools are to first select a tool that you want to use, um, verify if it's already supported on your campus, and if not, review the product's accessibility information. Um, the purpose of reviewing technology tools before actually utilizing them are to identify specific accessibility issues, um, determine if there are more accessible products available that would fulfill the same purpose, and if not, at least creating equivalent alternative assignment options for students that um, might be unable to use the tool. And in terms of universal design technology tools that ad adhere to the standard accessibility guidelines are not only required for for people with sensory issues like hearing loss or blindness, but they can also help people that don't have a documented disability, um, like students that find it easier to stay focused on a video if there's captions or if they're working in a place with other people and they forgot their headphones, um, or sometimes their hand might just hurt and um, they don't want to use the mouse, but if a tool wasn't designed to be accessible using just the keyboard, they, they won't be able to navigate it that way. And you can go to the next slide. Um, acquiring accessible tools, steps to keep in mind. All campuses should have some sort of process already in place for reviewing technology tools before they're utilized. Um, but de depending on your campus and um, what processes are in place, you may or may not already be aware of these basic guidelines for acquiring accessible tools. Um, step one, gather information on possible tools. So you don't just want to go with the first product that you come across that looks great. Um, when you have an idea of the kind of tool that you want um, and the purpose that it needs to serve, then conduct some market research on the various products out there that would fulfill this purpose. Um, there may be instances where a tool that you want to use is very specialized and there just aren't any alternative products. And in situations like that, if it's a tool that's really essential and um, valuable for student use, then it may need to be used anyway. And that's where alternative options come into play and the development of equivalent tasks for students that can't effectively use a tool. 
and having those alternative tools and assignment options um, can not only help students that physically can't access the tool, but um, if possible, it may help students that just prefer not to use it if that's an option um, which would support the UDL principles. Uh, step two, review um, accessibility information and documentation. Once you have a specific product in mind, ask the vendor for their accessibility documentation um, and how they've incorporated accessibility into their product. And if um, you ask a vendor about that um, and they don't have any documentation or they don't even know what you're talking about, um, that's definitely a red flag that their product is probably going to have some significant issues um, and an alternative option uh, should probably be planned for that. Step three, review the selected tools accessibility. Of course, it's ideal if there's someone on your campus that can actually test out the application to check for accessibility concerns, but with limited resources, that's often not a possibility. So at least asking the vendor about how they've incorporated accessibility standards into their product would be useful. Um, step four, determine alternative assignments. Um, so again, when a tool is necessary for student use, but it isn't fully accessible, having that plan in place with uh, equivalent alternative options may be a necessary workaround. Sorry, I, I probably talked really fast. I was trying to, to hurry through. So I think that's that's all for me. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, we have the Google Doc available for those who would like to sort of crowdsource um, some of the the, um, the concepts that we're discussing here, if you think of anything beyond um, what we've discussed, it would be great to um, share ideas. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna put the link in the chat. Um, I know we're over time today, so um, I think it would be great if you know you can return to this at any point. Um, we'd love to see more ideas. I put the link in there for you. You did, okay, thank you, Dennis, excellent. Yeah, so that's all for us today. Does anyone have any questions? Before we get to the questions, I want to say thank you in case people have to run because it is over time. We'll also make sure that the link to the slides and the Google Doc are in the Canvas course so people can jump in and add their ideas. Uh, and so um, thank you in advance to everyone for doing that. Even those who are watching the recording, we encourage you to join the fun. And now let's see what questions exist. And um, you can ask them by chat or raise your hand. People are still just processing all the great ideas you presented. <laughs> well, if there are none, uh, I'd like to say thanks. I'll stop the recording and stay around for people who do have uh, any questions about the Institute. Thank you so much. <laughs>